Hello, I'm Paul Perello, and welcome to another edition of The Philly Factor. Well, soon it will be that time of year when school is out and parents are going to pull their hair out of their head thinking, what am I going to do with the kids today? Well, what I can tell you, one of the first things you want to do is you want to pick up a copy of uh, my guest book, which I'm going to introduce here in a moment. Um, you might be an empty nester, for that matter, and you might be uh, looking for something to do on one uh, day. Uh, you might want to travel into Old City, maybe even travel outside of your comfort zone and, uh, and take in some of the locations included in this book. Retired? Yeah, you say you're bored of sitting in the house and watching television. You want to get a copy of this book. Every uh, which way you turn these days, there is something to do out in Philadelphia, in the greater Philadelphia area. Sometimes it may cost you a few dollars. Sometimes it might be absolutely free. My guest has compiled in her book things to do and see, whether it's running up the Rocky Steps at the Art Museum or visiting the Edgar Allan Poe House in Old City. There really is something for everyone to do in Philadelphia. You just need to know where to do it. Mary Dixon LeBeau is a former newspaper columnist, now a freelance writer, whose work has appeared in a variety of publications. She is the author of Secret Philadelphia, a guide to the weird, wonderful, and obscure, and she joins us on this edition of The Philly Factor. Mary, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. I can't brag enough about this book. As a matter of fact, this book doesn't stay in any one place for <laughs> a long period of time because somebody's picking it up and going through it. Uh, you've done a wonderful job in uh, highlighting many of these places in the city that are famous, perhaps not so famous. Um, what inspired, what was the spark behind this book? Well, to be honest with you, um, the idea of Secret Philadelphia came from my publisher. I uh, am an editor of a traveling portal for moms, travelingmom.com, mm -hmm. and one of my writers was writing a book for Reedy Press, and I asked her, um, because I knew it was travel related, would she mind if I pitched her editor? She said, no, go ahead, and gave me the name. Yeah. And I pitched a totally different book, actually, about um, Jersey Shore and the history of the Jersey Shore and what used to be there, how it used to be in, you know, the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, and he nixed the idea. He said <laughs> that the Jersey Shore is too seasonal. Uh, of course, what does he know? He's in St. Louis. He doesn't yeah. know how we are obsessed <laughs> with the shore exactly. around yeah. here. Yeah. But he said he was starting this secret um, series, and he already had secret St. Louis and Cleveland, I believe. He's in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So... Um, already on board, and he asked me, do you know anything about Philadelphia? He saw I was from South, South Jersey. And I said, I was born in, in Philadelphia. I, I grew up uh, right off of the Stella, right by Stella Maris Parish. I was born in St. Agnes's. I, I, yeah, I know Philly. He said, would you, be ha would you do the secret Philly book for us? Mm -hmm. And of course, I jumped on it. Yes, I'll do yeah, it. Yeah. And in my head, I'm thinking, there's nothing secret about Philadelphia. <laughs> We're a town that wears our heart on our sleeves. Yeah. You know, Everybody yeah. knows that you know, we, we love our sports teams and we throw snowballs at, snow, at Santa Claus and sure. all the stories and Rocky ran up the steps. Um, but then I thought about my in-laws. My husband is from Massachusetts, okay. not too far, hmm. but whenever my in-laws come down, they want to see the Rocky Steps and the Liberty Bell and they want to eat a cheesesteak and that's all they know about Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought, well, if everything else is sort of secret to people, let me dig there. And the funny part was, once I started digging, I found things that I didn't even know as a native. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, uh, interesting you say what you said about your in-laws, because my first broadcasting job was in the Midwest. Okay. And they saw Philadelphia as, the only thing they saw Philadelphia as was the home of the Liberty Bell. Mm -hmm. And they knew it was between New York and Washington, but they only knew Philadelphia for, of course, it's a historic reference to, the, I mean, the country began here, but they only knew Philadelphia for the Liberty Bell. Now, this was also 1979, and the Convention and Visitors Bureau has done a tremendous Absolutely. job sort of peeling back, you know, all the secrets that are out there. But still, I'm surprised how many people that live here, whether in South Jersey or Philadelphia, that haven't seen the Liberty Bell, who haven't been to Independence Hall, and don't even know that Edgar Allan Poe lived here for a short time. They're like, really? I was like, yeah, you know that home north of Independence Mall where there's a very large... Raven, yeah, that's mm -hmm. Edgar Allan Poe's house. You, that's one of the places that you've put in your book. That's actually one of my favorite secrets. Um, that goes back to my husband, too. He works overnight, so I had five children, and we had to keep them quiet during the day because Daddy had to sleep. So I would take them out on these day trips, but of course I wanted to keep it cheap, five kids. Yeah. Um, Edgar Allan Poe house is a wonderful um, site run by the National Park System uh, where you can go in, you can 
see Poe's writings. You, they have a film there about Poe. They have one of the junior ranger programs there, so the kids actually can investigate things and walk away with a souvenir, mm. and it doesn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, it's a great um, place to visit. Yep. I, I thought it was going to go terribly different here. I thought you were going to say you threatened the kids about uh, the raven and read, read <laughs> no, the raven no, to them no. to keep them quiet. <laughs> but I'm glad it didn't go, <laughs> didn't go that way. But uh, Edgar Allan Poe House, yeah, I, I remember uh, uh, years ago when um, I, I was teaching a class uh, at Drexel, and it was a, a college freshman orientation class. And one of the places that they had to, to complete the curriculum was to visit the Edgar oh, Allan wow. Poe House. And even for me, that was an eye-opening experience because I didn't know that he lived here um, for a time. And did he write the Raven here? Is that why the statue's there or? Um, yes, actually he did. Um, funny story, and this was gonna jump ahead to something else, but um, my favorite geek out moment when I'm writing this book was about the Raven. I knew about the Edgar Allan Poe House because I, as I brought my children there, um, However, did you know that the actual raven that inspired Poe is, of course, dead, but stuffed and in Philadelphia? I did not know that. This, and I was an English major, so yeah. I should have known this. But uh, yeah, the actual raven that inspired Poe was first belonged to Charles Dickens. How about that? His name was Grip, and he was a pet of the, the Dickens children. And Charles Dickens had written a, a short story, not one of his bigger known stories, that included the talking raven. Mm -hmm. Poe was at that time um, a critic, of, a literature critic for a Philadelphia press. And uh, he wrote a, a review of this story and he sort of usurped the idea of the talking raven hmm. and went on to put himself on the books by writing, um, writing The Raven. Yeah. Grip the Raven can be found at the rare book section of the Philadelphia Free Library. How about Another that? free trip. You can take your kids and see something that's uh, educational. Yeah. And you know, you talk about a place like the you know the central branch of the free library, mm -hmm. where they have oftentimes, and again, it's free. Uh, and if you're not go if you're going there to take out books or whatever, and you're a member, that's great. But they also have um, um, exhibits that come and go, th you know, throughout the year. And again, it's free. You know, it'd be well worth the while to uh, stop by, especially during the summer where the kids are starting to climb the walls. They're bored. You know, you hop on a septa bus or you you know you. Uh, take an Uber, whatever, and you go to the free library, it's a world of experience there that oftentimes people are familiar with their corner or neighborhood library, but not the big central branch that we have up on the parkway. And the staff there is wonderful, mm -hmm. extremely helpful. I told them what I was doing and they were the ones who brought me to different things and showed me where to find grip and, and allowed me to take the pictures of him and that kind of thing. They, yeah. they are willing to help just let them know what you're looking for and what teachable moment you want this summer and, and they can help you yeah, out. Fantastic. Um, let's go up the parkway a little bit up okay. to the steps of the art museum that are famous um, because of this little old movie back in 1976 that uh, Sylvester Stallone uh, starred in. Everybody comes to Philadelphia and they want to run the Rocky steps. Absolutely. But if you're going up to the top and expecting to see the Rocky statue, not that you're going to be surprised, he's there, but he's off to the side at the bottom of the at steps. At the bottom, right. Yeah, and that's another must-take picture moment at the, at the Rocky statue. Absolutely. Yeah, that, like I said, my in-laws, that's one of the things they knew about. But what we could surprise them with was additional Rocky information. Um, Obviously, you can take them to uh, the, the uh, Italian market where yeah. they can see where Rocky beat the, beat the side of beef. One thing I really enjoyed finding, um, I didn't know about myself, was going to uh, Laurel Hill Cemetery. They actually have the, the gravestone for Adrian Balboa mm -hmm. right there. Um, they actually filmed the, filmed the uh, funeral there, and when the funeral was over, they left the gravestone there. Apparently, her brother, Paulie, or, yeah. or maybe it was Mickey, who died a couple years later in the films, they also buried him there, but that gravestone does not, does not exist anymore because it was made of fiberglass and it blew away. Oh, wow. The stone for Adrian Balboa, though, is still it's there still because there. it was stone. Yeah, and the same, uh, the same cemetery, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go and explore, and cemeteries, not to sound like this is sort of like, you know, crazy, but um, no. uh, cemeteries are great places to explore because they're so full of history. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at these gravestones and they go back to like the 1800s, if not earlier, and you got to wonder like, who these people were and what brought them here and, and how did they die and, you know, and, and, and what type of uh, member of society were there. Uh, but uh, in that same cemetery, it's also where the world famous uh, Phillies broadcaster, Harry Callis, Harry Callis is also uh, buried there. Exactly, I think the picture is in the book of yeah. Harry Callis' grave because it has a giant microphone and seats from the vet yeah. right there. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I found that a lot of the stories that I found for Secret Philadelphia actually came from the churches and the graveyards uh, mm -hmm. in Philly because yeah. there are so many stories there. We go back so far. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about another place in downtown Philadelphia that um, you may have walked past it a number of times down around south, right off of South Street. It is uh, where um, Larry Fine was born. There is a mural painted on the side of the building where Larry Fine's family lived and where, you know, where he lived, where he was born. Um, the, there was a bar there, which has since closed, but the mural is still there. And a lot of people know Larry Fine, of course, from uh, the Three Stooges, but they may not know that he um, lived in Philadelphia. He was one of us, but he was also uh, an accomplished uh, musician. Uh, and uh, here he is living right off of South Street in downtown Philadelphia. And apparently that became because he had some kind of injury to his arm as a child. Yeah. And so his parents had him... Uh, both do boxing and yeah. do the violin to just keep up his uh, agility in his in his arms. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, Larry Fine is a big surprise to me, um, and strangely enough, I've done a lot of presentations to historical societies because obviously Philadelphia is so historical. Yeah. And every time I ask them, "Is there any questions?" Uh, and it's based on the book, they always ask, "What do the Stooges have to do <laughs> <laughs> with Philadelphia?" Yeah. No one seems to know. But yeah, Larry Fine was born right here on South Street, um, right where the mural is. That that was his birthplace. Yeah. And, um, and then there's the Stugium. As yeah, which is outside of Philadelphia, Montgomery County, right? Yes. And I believe it's by appointment only you can go in. I don't know if they have certain set hours. I do believe in the summer they do have certain hours, but it's during the week it's, and it's off, off hours, so you have to call. Yeah. Um, but they are a wonderful museum. I think I shared with you that I'm not a big Stooge fan, mm -hmm. um, but I'm a big fan of the Stugium because they, the way they present everything, you learn a lot. It's very interactive. Your kids will love it. Um, and they... They go through, like they even have like all the Stooges, not just the ones, not just the just not um, Larry uh, Fine, and yeah. and one of the Joes, I believe, is also from Philly. Yeah. But uh, but they go carry ca cover um, the Howard brothers and and yeah. everything. Um, I can't think of the guy's Cur name. It's mm -hmm. uh, Curly Joe Devita, I believe, who's is, also uh, from Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I believe that the. Owner of the Stugium is actually Larry Fine, is related in some yes, way. Yes, I think he's a great nephew. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, again, right outside of Philadelphia, and whether you're a Stooge fan or not, um, and maybe the younger kids may not necessarily get it, but if you're a guy and if you're, you know, <laughs> uh, you, and you have sons, we all get the Three Stooges. You know, and there are a number of women that like the Three Stooges too, but. Um, they've done a wonderful job with that with that museum. And if you have to bring your kids along, they even have um, video games and such about the Stooges that the kids will enjoy. Yeah. Um, how many, uh, and this may be like a curveball, but how many secrets have you put into this book? Well, there are, that's a good story. There are 90 different stories in right. the book. Okay. Uh, but some of them carry more than one secret, such as I, there's a page I did on giant food. Um, because you can find giant food throughout the city. Mm -hmm. There's a giant olive. There's a giant tasty cake. Not the, not the supermarket, <laughs> but we're no. talking about giant giant food, food. like okay. sculpture. Right. There's a giant tasty cake. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go, there's a giant tasty twist um, in the Northeast, a, a custard stand. Uh, so I just did a page of all the different giant foods you can find around. Um, there's also giant ants on South Street that uh, would come <laughs> to the picnic if you did the giant food. Yeah. So um, 90 different stories, but some of the secrets include more than one. Yeah. Um, we, you also have in the book, um, you know, the, uh, I guess the, the cheesesteak wars uh, mm -hmm. in Philadelphia because everybody knows of the rivalry between uh, Pat's and Geno's that are literally located across the street from each other. And, you know, um, a lot of people may skip Pat's and Geno's if they live in Philadelphia, Absolutely. they may go to the corner uh, steak shop. But it is, you know, besides Rocky, the Rocky Steps, the Liberty Bell, uh, that's probably the third on the list of, of tourist attractions when people come to Philadelphia. They have to have a cheesesteak. Exactly. And I, I include it in the book, not as a recommendation of which cheesesteak place is the best, but just the history of cheesesteaks is right here. This is where it all started. People think Philly and cheesesteaks, but not everybody knows about Pat's and Gino's and how they are still operational, yeah. still fighting each other, basically, mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a friendly rivalry about who has the best stake in the city, which yeah. 
like you said, could be any one of numerous neighborhood places. And, and these are, uh, I mean, these are locations that you could chart your own tour if you want, because you could go to Pat's and Gino's and then you could walk right up 9th Street and sort of relive that Rocky moment mm -hmm. from Rocky, the first movie where he's running down the, you know, running down 9th Street. Um, or you could just uh, pick and choose some of these locations if you want to start out in the suburbs or if you want to go in downtown Philadelphia. Maybe you want to take in an afternoon uh, lunch in the Wanamaker's building and hear a concert um, because, which has been there forever, at least I can remember, is this magnificent pipe organ yep. in the, um, uh, the atrium of the Wanamaker's building and they still have uh, organ recitals there every day, right? Exactly, and, and most people uh, associate that with Christmas and the light show, yeah. which of course is fabulous, but that's there year round, like you're saying. And I like how you said that you can like chart your own course and, and make your own tour because that's what I've been finding. Um, like for example, Hamilton is coming to town yeah. uh, in the summer. So a lot of friends of, who are visiting us wanted to know more about what Hamilton had in Philadelphia. Well, there are sites in here, the first bank, the second mm -hmm. bank, uh, the Federal Reserve, all were part of Hamilton's history. And so we could do a Hamilton tour at Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've done a birds tour. We looked at Grip, uh, we looked at the Raven, mm -hmm. uh, the Eagle's mural outside yeah, yeah. is more birds. And there's also Peter the Eagle who was in the, in the Mint. Yeah. Uh, so we made a tour of birds and, yeah. and uh, took our, our friends there. Um, you can find anything that interests you and, and find a thread. And throughout the book, you can find ways to put it together and make your own tour. And the other thing is that there's some remarkable photos that have been captured uh, in the book. And uh, Mary had told me before the show that uh, these aren't necessarily um, uh, textbook photos or public domain photos. Either Mary or husband or one of her children actually snapped the photos that were included in, in the book. And that in, unto itself is a great family um, um, well, I'll say it, it sounds like a f great family uh, experiment or experience together, although, you know, you might have, a, you know, a kid that uh, wants to have editorial content over their photo, but well, the, uh, <laughs> I didn't have that problem, <laughs> you didn't have that problem. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I want this photo in the book and you want that photo no. in the book. Actually, the publisher picked what went in. We, we just sent the you pictures. You sent the pictures, yeah. But, um, yeah, m part of the rules I set for myself is that I had to visit everything. I yeah. did not want to put something in there just because I read about it. I had to actually go to the site. And unfortunately, there were some things that were left out because I couldn't get, like you said, some things are by appointment and we couldn't set it up. Yeah. Um, but it was great, great to just grab a kid and have them take pictures of their view. Um, my kids are older. I mean, the youngest is mm -hmm. 15. But um, so we're not talking little kids, but yeah. it still was great to bomb with them, like, you know, my 20 somethings yeah. that, that would come along and take pictures. And um, like I said, we had to go to each one and we had to make sure we got a picture of each one. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, that made it an interesting, it was a very fun book to write. Yeah. Um, uh, Mary, uh, uh, walk me through the, uh, I guess, the process of once you talked to the publisher and you came up with the concept mm -hmm. uh, until it came to the final product that we have here on the table. I mean, how long did it take from start to finish? Okay, I first talked to the publisher in January of 2017, and I got my contract in February of 2017. My deadline was November 1st of 2017. So it was a pretty quick quick uh, writing process. and. Um, Basically, the pictures were the hardest part. I personally had to go out to every site because I wouldn't write about something without seeing it. Sure. Um, but it didn't matter who took the pictures. Right. So I would grab anybody in the family who was available. Um, I immediately started with a spreadsheet. I wrote down everything that I knew that I'd like to put in the book. Mm -hmm. And then I would go out to sites. And then when I was there, I would talk to the people. And people in Philly are surprisingly open about sharing these secrets. Yeah. Uh, they would tell me, you know, like when I was at Geno's and Pat's, they would say, well, you know what, down the street, there's this fountain that sings. There's a singing fountain. Never <laughs> exactly, knew it. yeah. and it's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> um, but if, so we, it was okay, let's walk over there and check that out. Um, a lot of it was like that. People would just, uh, you know, when we, they heard our project, they would uh, give us other suggestions of what they found. Mm -hmm. uh, even to this day, when I go out and speak about the book, People say, can you look into what this is about or what's that? Or, you know, I saw this off the highway. Can you check into that? Yeah. So there's a lot out there that um, people are willing, really curious about. And that, that's really, um, I guess, what spurred the book. But uh, so I did a spreadsheet and I kept on adding to it and I broke it off into neighborhoods so I could like go to one neighborhood at one time and, and sure. take as many pictures as possible. And um, then it went to the publisher in uh, November and then went through the editing process. Like I said, they picked the pictures that were going to go there. Uh, they did the cover, which I at first wasn't happy with. I, they had another cover first that I liked better, but, uh, but 
but they were brilliant because they put the Stooges on it, and that's apparently that's is gonna a sell. seller. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could be the Three Stooges at anything, the Three Stooges are going to sell. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that was their idea. All kudos to, to Reedy. And, uh, and the book came out uh, last, end of last April. Yeah. So, so uh, when you compile all that, so uh, two questions, one mm -hmm. of which is you, you mentioned that people will say to you, oh, uh, can you check this out? What is this? So do you find people uh, are eager and willing to offer up their ideas to you and say, hey, you know, you got to check this out. Or, you know, there's this place in my neighborhood. I'm not quite sure what it is. So um, did that spur some interest on your part that you actually then went and investigated further? Oh, absolutely. Like yeah. I said about the, uh, the, the singing the, fountain, the singing fountain. Yeah. I never heard of it, but I went there. Um, it's always I mean, when people are really interested in something and they're giving you those ideas, it's always good to look into them and find out what's going on there because there's real stories. Yeah. And um, that's, to me, that's what the book is. It's, it's 90 different stories of things that are going on in Philly. There are things that are not secret, like, um, like um, Reading Terminal Market. Obviously, everybody goes to Reading sure. Terminal Market. Yeah. What do you know about Reading Term Terminal Market? Great food. Okay, but did you know about the big piggy bank in the middle? That's what we wrote about. We focused on the things that were maybe not overlooked, but not, not as well known, yeah. and wrote the stories behind those. Yeah. So we weren't a touching on the story that everybody knows. Yeah, sometimes the best secrets are the ones that are right in front of you. Exactly, often. that um, you walk by a million times. Yeah, and it's like, you know, <laughs> oh, I didn't know that was there. Well, it's been there for like 100 years, mm -hmm. right? Um, did you put these 90 secrets or stories in the book? I suspect that you must have had 590 of them. So my question is, how do you whittle down, or was it the editor that whittled it down? You had complete editorial control over it. Well, that was mine, yeah. These yeah. are the 90 stories that I presented to him, and some of them were just, some stories were better than the others mm -hmm. that I you know, was determined to get in the book. Some of them was availability of pictures. Mm -hmm. um, there were some places that wouldn't allow us to take pictures, even mm -hmm. though we were there, and so we didn't use them. Yeah. Um, and there's still some that I would, I would have liked to have seen put in, but it just for spaces, we have to mm. leave them out. So who knows? Maybe uh, somebody else will do Secret Philly. Or I was <laughs> going to say, might there be a second book uh, that you would, uh, you would uh, dive into? Well, interestingly, it's come full circle. Yes, uh, Reedy has asked me to write a second book, but this book is about the history of the Jersey Shore. Go figure. Wow, go figure. <laughs> well, what did he have, an aha moment that, well, you know, this Jersey Shore thing is more than just a television show, you know, with a uh, bunch of, uh, you know, 20-year-olds. Yeah. That may have hurt us, in, you know, yeah. for a while because, yeah. but uh, yeah, he, I met with my publisher. He actually came to Philly in, in January. Yeah. And uh, at that breakfast, he offered me this wow. book. So that's what I'm working on now. So if anybody knows any secrets about the Jersey Shore, <laughs> send them my way. I mean, there's, there's the obvious there with Lucy the Elephant and there, you know, some of those you know, um, um, again, they're right there in front of you. Right. But, you know, what, what do you, you know, how do you distinguish something like a Lucy the Elephant as opposed, and like the Liberty Bell? They're, you know, they're, they're part of the fabric of our, of our landscape, but they're, they're the obvious things. Right. I mean, unless there's something unknown about the Liberty Bell or Lucy the Elephant, would they or would they not be included in the book? Well, the Liberty Bell is not included in the book. Um, the, see, the one about the Jersey Shore is a little different because it's going to be about things that no longer are used as they used to be. I see. So okay. Lucy would be included because Lucy used to be a hotel. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and a real estate uh, marketing device, and now it's a, a tourist attraction. Yeah. And she's been moved a couple of times. So, yeah. uh, so Lucy probably will be in the book, but the Liberty Bell wasn't because it's so obvious. It's, like you said, it's part of our fabric. Yeah. yeah. Not a secret. <laughs> um, uh, how much fun was this for you? Oh my gosh. I mean, given your, <laughs> given your newspaper and your, your, your writing background, um, you know, some people say, oh, I, I, I would love to write a book, but I don't even know where to begin. So what has this whole experience been like for you? I was a reporter and a columnist, and I, I loved doing that, and I freelanced you know, for a variety of magazines. Uh, but people would say to me, do you want to write a book? And I'd say, I don't have more than 2,000 words on any one subject. I, yeah. I peter out, I get tired. That's why this book was perfect for me, because even though it is, I don't even know how many words, um, they were all, it was 90 short stories. Yeah. And I take 90 um, focused stories on, on different places. Writing the book was a blast. Uh, I absolutely loved it. it. In fact, when we stopped writing, I said to my husband, I miss like waking up on a Saturday and saying, let's head over to Philly and see yeah. what we can find. Yeah. Um, and sometimes we still like revisit where we were and mm -hmm. uh, not just for taking picture purposes or, or information purposes, but to really enjoy 
like the landscape of, yeah. of Laurel Hill or yeah. or the um, the beautiful stained glass of the fire of the fire hall mm -hmm. um, the fire hall museum. Yeah. There's so much that we I guess didn't appreciate as we rushed through and tried to get all the work done that it's it's good now to use this as a guidebook. In fact, uh, my my parents say they're going to make a a sheet and just check off how many <laughs> secrets they can go and find. And yeah. it's a, it's a That's good way a to direct. Great it. idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is there one, is like sort of asking which of your children is your favorite, but is there that one moment or that one place that you visited that was so defining for you? Um, you know, maybe it was the singing fountain or you know, one place that sort of stands out above all the rest. Um, I already said grip, like sort of geeked me out just right. because I was an English major. However, the one place that really stands out and I, I probably tell it everywhere I go is the, the cave in the Wissican Park, hmm. uh, the cave of Kelpius. Mm -hmm. um, there was a sect before we even had a constitution, before we even was a country in the 17th century, a sect uh, of men led by Johannes Kelpius uh, lived in a cave in the Wissican Park uh, waiting out the end of days. They believed the world was going to come to an end uh, that year, which was, I think, 1640-something. Right. Obviously, it didn't work out for yeah, them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, par the cave is still there, and it's like sort of meticulously kept. So uh, it's right off one of the biking paths in Wissickin Park. We walked the path. We you know, climbed over the, the logs and such to get to it. Uh, it's, not, it's not a simple, it's not a paved route. There's no signage. But uh, once you find it, it's like, wow, this is a real discovery right here in Philadelphia. Uh, you feel like you're as far away as you can possibly be from Center City. You're mm -hmm. like in the middle of the woods with this with this cave where people actually thought, you know, they would stay until Jesus came back. And yeah, <laughs> wow, that's that's amazing. Uh, I want to mention that the uh, the book is available in bookstores. Mm -hmm. uh, they could also go online and order the book if they like. Mm -hmm. uh, and where can we find out more information about you, Mary? Uh, well, the book itself has a website, secretphillyguide.com. Uh, it also has its own Facebook page, and there's my Facebook page, uh, Mary Dixon LeBeau. Okay. Um, you will be thoroughly entertained with this book, Secret Philadelphia Guide to the Weird, Wonderful, and Obscure. Mary Dixon LeBeau, I want to thank you for being with us on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Thank you. Until the next time, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for being with us. This is The Philly Factor.